thank you, Selena. And let, let me just start by um, saying a big thank you to um, the Global Forum on uh, democratizing work. Uh, and also a big, big thank you to SBF and Neera Chandok for organizing this. I must say that this is uh, a, a powerful idea. And this is an idea on which we have not had enough con uh, conversations. Can I, can I request my co-panelists to mute their lines? There's some uh, hissing sound that I hear. So, yeah, so, you know, let, let me start. We, we are starting late, so I'll try and uh, kind of reduce the comments that I had. Uh, but let me start on a grim note. And this grim note is, we've all experienced it, uh, but the heart-wrenching journey that we saw of the migrant workers last year, absolutely heart-wrenching. Uh, people walking thousands of kilometers, bare feet, 42, 44 degree centigrade, often without food or water. And they were still uh, made to face police brutalities. Very often the police was, instead of helping them, actually uh, caning them. Uh, and they had to then leave the main roads and try and find alternative paths to uh, reach where they wanted to reach. I th it, it was fairly clear that uh, what we were seeing is the complete failure of our uh, entire system. Particularly, these migrant labor uh, did not have any kind of social security, uh, no job security, no contractual security. And that was one of the reasons uh, uh, why they were going back. So that's, that's scene one. Taking you just a year later, equally heart-wrenching, I would say probably even more painful. Uh, we did see, as in, in, in this phase, I had my own friends literally dying, uh, waiting at hospital reception just for an oxygen cylinder. And that's what we saw. And, and it was not just unique to, to me. Uh, sadly, pretty much everyone in this country knows someone personally uh, who lost his or her life uh, during this, this second phase of the pandemic. And what it reflected was a complete collapse of the public health system. You know, the doctors and the nurses, the paramedics did a fantastic job as individuals. Uh, but it was fairly clear that as a health system, we were not able to cope with it. And what became even more evident was the much tom tommed insurance model uh, of health was a complete failure. It just did not address the needs of, of, of uh, common people, certainly not of the, uh, the poor and marginalized. And, and that's what we uh, uh, saw. Uh, but it is, you know, I would say, uh, you know, interesting that tough questions have not been asked of the government at all. You know, questions about why public health is underfunded, why are we moving from a public health system to a privatized uh, health system? There have been very little uh, questions around this. It's, it's, it, I find it really surprising. Apart from few passionate uh, appeals, uh, one that stands out in my mind is uh, Professor Manoj Jha, uh, Member of Parliament, speaking for the right to health. Uh, but largely, it's it's really not been a conversation point. And uh, what I think was is more worrying, that now it seems as if people have politically forgotten the issue. That's that's the big worry. And is it happening? Because a lot of people are writing about it, and and what I notice, and and you know that finds resonance the argument, and I think that's one of the central questions for our panel. Uh, that probably it's a triumph of the neoliberal vision uh, in which people have started believing uh, that health is not the responsibility of the state. It's not a right and entitlement. And it's their responsibility to find uh, health support, health services. And, and that's, that's what it seems like. They, they, why are they not angry? Uh, is the question that comes, and this is uh, uh, the argument that, that we hear. 
you know what i also think is is uh, you know very very depressing i thought was i talked of the migrant crisis and that's the time when the hard fought and won uh, labor rights won over decades of struggles were pre pretty much exactly at the same time uh, they were being dismantled uh, and and again there was not much criticism happening uh, apart from the regular criticism in, in the public domain it seemed that it was all right even you know it was so ironic it was almost like black humor but people uh, the government and and several states actually went ahead with dismantling diluting the labor uh, uh, rights particularly at that 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 moment so you know I, I you know i just wanted to bring these two three the 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 lack of social contract uh, social security for the informal sector worker how we have not looked at health as a as a fundamental right how hard uh, fought uh, rights which have which have pretty much rested rights uh, are being diluted so i just wanted to go back and reflect on what does it reflect on the social contract that we have uh, the social contract, which clearly so powerfully enshrined in our constitution, which talks of us as, as rights, rights bearing citizens, uh, including the, uh, the directive principles. Uh, but what we are seeing is actually shrinking of that's right, that right space. We would have uh, ordinarily assumed that there is expansion and deepening of these rights. But what we are seeing is actually uh, truncating of, of these rights, the right space, the rights discourse. So, you know, I, I think that's that's a question that I want us to probe. Why is this happening? And more importantly, how can we reverse uh, uh, that trend? Let, let me just say uh, a few more things. You know, one of the things I would say, and, and in this conversation, yes, we are aware that at the moment, civil political rights are hugely under challenge. Uh, but I think that the economic, social, cultural rights are also equally under threat. And in this conversation, if we can focus on that, uh, I think it would be important. Uh, and I do agree, and, and that's again something that I wanted to flag, that we all talk about indivisibility of rights, uh, the interdependence of rights, but somewhere probably we looked at much more of the socio-economic rights. So I'm just also reflecting back. Uh, you know, the three of you, uh, I will certainly introduce you uh, when I request you to speak. Uh, but but you have been absolute champions of many of these rights, and you you played uh, very important roles. Or maybe I should actually introduce you at this moment. Uh, so. Harsh Mandar, uh, author, activist, uh, president of the Center for Equity Studies, uh, founder of uh, Karma e Mohabbat, and, and he does multiple roles. But uh, in this context, let me also say he was a member of the National Advisory Council. Uh, so welcome, Harsh Ji. And, and I'll move on with more of my comments, uh, questions. But uh, let me also welcome uh, Mr. Raju. Mr. Raju again played a very, very important uh, role in this entire uh, expansion of rights, uh, golden era, the decade that saw several rights become real. And Mr. Uh, Raju uh, comes from the administrative services, was the secretary of the NAC, and currently works with the Indian National Congress. So again, welcome, uh, Mr. Raju. And Nikhil uh, is one of the foremost voices of civil society works with Majdur Kisan Shakti Sangathan, with uh, the National Campaign for Right to Information, also part of the Suchna and Rozkar Adhikar Andolan Nikhil, I, I hope I got it right. And Nikhil was playing such an important role in actually articulating the demands from uh, the people uh, to ensure that those rights are, are converted into rights, which were demands then. So the three of you have played such an important role uh, uh, in this. So, you know, this at this juncture, the, the you know what I've talked of of how rights are getting now 
truncated, shrinking space. So, you know, one big question that I wanted to ask you is that we were, were we naive in focusing so much on the socioeconomic rights, uh, but not adequately looking at the macroeconomic structures? Because on the other hand, there was such massive rise of neoliberalism happening post 90s. And, and, you know, I work on inequality. We know how obscene levels inequality has reached. Uh, at least one data that I keep using because that's so powerful that two years ago, nine people in, in India had more wealth than 50% of the Indian population, which would be around, what, 650 uh, million people. So how do we actually address this question? So there... One is that this move from rights-bearing citizens to consumers. The second is the indivisibility of rights that I, I, I flagged. The third, that macroeconomic structures uh, running parallel to the discourse of rights that we were talking of uh, are the three questions that I particularly wanted to highlight. But let me just add one more, which I think is critical, that uh, Indian constitution is obviously talks of, of the three fundamental uh, liberty, um, equality, and fraternity. But I think what it also adds is the notion of justice, which is so important uh, to the entire, uh, I would say, uh, visualization of the Republic of, of India. It's, it's central to that. And in that, particularly uh, the, the Dalits, the Adivasis, the marginalized, the Muslims, the minorities are also at the center of, of, of this discourse around particularly social justice. But if you look at, again, the question of rights, as an Oxfam did a, a survey uh, during COVID too, and uh, the, the people coming from marginalized communities had uh, five times worse experience than people coming from upper caste in terms of just accessing healthcare. Uh, so, so, and there's enough data. We know the the huge gaps. Whether you look at the right to education, so uh, upper caste male, uh, and and uh, between the upper caste male and the uh, say the Adivasi women, there would be still 20 to 25 percent uh, difference in terms of literacy rate itself. So that's that's the level of 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 difference, and it is very clear that these marginalized communities do need the state to deliver the promise of justice that we are talking of. However, what we are looking at is a dismantling of the welfare state. We are looking at dismantling of the welfare state, which initially was called, say, the regulatory state, and which at least now, with the, with, with the contours it's taken of crony capitalism, a lot of commentators are saying it's a predatory state. So in, in this context, how do we look at the, the question that we are engaging with of citizens as holders of inalienable rights. I think that's that's something that we need to locate. But let me just, you know, my let me end my opening comments with um, the fact that uh, uh, people's struggles continues inspiring us. And, and what we have seen over the last few decades, it's people's struggles which have been able to create uh, those rights. Uh, and, and uh, get those entitlements. How much hope do we have with people's struggles? What do we need to do moving forward is also, uh, I would say, a very critical question for me. So, so let me just stop here. The idea was that we request you to do 12 to 14 minutes, but if you can try and do it now with, uh, say, 10 to 12 minutes, because we've lost a lot of time uh, because of the technological challenges. So if that's all right, let me request, uh, start with Harshji, then I'll go to Rajuji and then Nikhil, if that's, that's a reasonable order for all of you. Okay, Harshji. Thank you uh, uh, very much. Uh, I think, you know, in many ways, your, your remarks uh, laid the ground uh, for much of what I wanted to say. Um, I'm glad that you started off with uh, the present uh, uh, crisis uh, created by the pandemic and our response to it. 
uh, we are still in the midst of what is likely to be the gravest humanitarian crisis that most of us, except those who were alive during partition, are like, have seen and hopefully will see in our lifetimes. Um, Arundhati Roy uh, spoke about COVID-19 as a virus, but she also spoke about it as an X-ray. Uh, she said it, it's an X-ray of the kind of society that we have. And I think that it is in this moment of, uh, of this unprecedented humanitarian crisis uh, that we need to look closely at our society. And uh, uh, many of the questions that, uh, that we are discussing today uh, come to very sharp uh, focus uh, when we look uh, at this X-ray. Uh, there's firstly the question of inequality. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've seen deeply unequal society, a profound absence of public compassion and of fraternity, of justice. Uh, we're seeing uh, public policies that, uh, that in their very design excluded uh, the poor from the protections and yet placed intolerable burdens on their shoulders of, uh, of for massive explosion of hunger and joblessness. Uh, first, let me you know, briefly take the question of inequality and uh, Amitabh uh, and has been working and, and the reports are very, very powerful. But sometimes it's said, you know, uh, we might be, uh, you know, exaggerating the importance of inequality because uh, say India and China have comparable levels of inequality. Uh, but uh, Amartya Sen uh, reminded us that what he called the penalty of inequality is much greater in India than in China. And, and why is that so? It's because if I was in the bottom 10% in India compared to the bottom 10% in China, the, in the bottom 10% in China, I, I would still have access to a decent school for my child. Uh, I would still have a hospital, a public hospital where I could take my child when she falls ill. But none of that would be available to me in India. And therefore, inequality has a much greater penalty because of the failure of, of, of state provisioning uh, of the kind that we're talking about. Uh, the inequality that we see here is also one uh, which is characterized by uh, a, you know, what I would call a spectacular absence of caring uh, by the elite uh, about the suffering of, 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 of working people. And, and I think that's one of the most traumatic lessons that we've learned from the second wave. And, uh, and what Amitabh said that you know, the, the lessons are so clear and yet Already it seems that we have forgotten them uh, and, uh, and uh, people of relative privilege are moving ahead uh, on the same direction that has caused such devastation. Uh, this is, you know, I, I think many things that, that uh, this crisis has shown, but I think you know, if I have to prioritize uh, a few of them, I think one of them is how critically important is labor rights uh, and a framework of social security for all. Um, we, we found uh, nine out of 10 workers in India are informal workers. And uh, suddenly overnight when the state uh, chose to close down the entire economy, all demand, all supply with, uh, with, with one of the smallest relief packages in the world. Uh, the devastation that it left uh, the working poor in because they had no uh, social security of any kind and job security to fall back on. And the second was the question of, of public health, uh, which Amitabh referred to, and I, I, I hope to get a little time to talk about that as well. But I think uh, the larger framework that I wanted to speak about was that the time has come for us uh, to acknowledge how crucially important in within the neoliberal framework that we have uh, to create uh, a framework of universal social rights. Um, we have talked about social uh, and economic rights, uh, but but not uh, but not in the entire gamut uh, with the kind of 
of of of of uh, political and social consensus that is required for these. Uh, Prabhat Patnaik, one of our most respected economists, uh, actually talks about uh, the struggle for universal social rights as as the new class struggle of our times. Uh, even if we tangle ourselves with debates and questions about neoliberalism, about you know the respective role of markets and the state, I think that what has become you know, manifest and, and, and clear is the imperative for what I call an, an, a new social contract. Um, even if we go ahead uh, uh, consensually uh, with uh, a market-driven economic growth, uh, although I think there's a great deal to debate about it, can we at least agree today uh, that there should be a floor of human dignity below which no one, no one will be allowed to fall. And this should be our new social contract. Um, I recall, uh, you know, when the food security bill was, uh, was being debated in parliament, um, there, were very, there were very few voices from the entire political spectrum, including of the countess, uh, which, which really was willing to stand up and defend the idea of the Food Security Act. Uh, and uh, and I found myself in front of television cameras every day um, when 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 uh, the act was being uh, and the bill was being debated in Parliament, and I found that everybody was enraged, including the anchors, including all the anchors, not just the one who's ones who are normally enraged. And I couldn't understand where all of this rage was coming from. And at one point. Uh, one particular industrialist, uh, she turned to me and said, I'm fed up, you know, what's the problem? I've made money because I've worked hard. I've done nothing to harm the economy. Why should I be taxed to feed the poor? And suddenly I understood where this rage was coming from. I said to her that I'm sorry, the poor work much harder than you. They have done far less to harm the economy. And in a good society, people of relative wealth and privilege are happy to share some of this so that life is is dignified and bearable for for the rest and and uh, and i and i recognize now that it is it is a moral question as as a, as a as a society as a culture that we need to ask ourselves what is a good society how far have we have we tra uh, tra uh, lost our way and, and we need to keep, create a framework uh, of this kind of floor of human dignity, uh, which we collectively resolve. Uh, no one will be allowed to fall below. Uh, the details can be worked out. No child should have to work instead of uh, going to a decent school uh, of equal quality to others. Everyone should have, you know, have health care. Old people should uh, not have to work till their last day until uh, without a, a decent pension and so on and so forth. Uh, the idea of labor rights, uh, again, I think uh, needs uh, needs just a, a moment's discussion. Uh, we hear, continue to hear the argument that actually labor will be better off with less protections. Uh, and and uh, the argument is that flexible labor markets will actually spur massive economic growth, which will spur massive job growth, and therefore laborers will paradoxically be better off with fewer protections. I think that argument has been, has been, you know, manifestly uh, broken down and shattered, uh, most of all because the period of neoliberal economic growth in India from 2004 to 2010 in, in particular, and in the years that have followed, have been periods of almost jobless growth. And if jobs are not being created, young people are being added to the workforce in large numbers with no futures to look forward to. And therefore, you know, we cannot say uh, that workers are better off without without rights. And and we saw what happened to them uh, when when a calamity of the scale of a nationwide lockdown uh, without relief uh, hit them. 
it's also important to talk about legal right to work and i, I know that there, there was some discussion about this here an urban employment guarantee scheme backed by law is an idea of which the time has has long come um, and we need to you know think about it will be very different from the rural employment guarantee we'll have to look at things like the care economy for instance in a substantial way uh, a lot of the employment would be in the care economy would be in ensuring basic human infrastructure for all people social housing uh, clean water they need sanitation in slums and so on and so forth and we need of course a public health system uh, one that works for all that works best for the working poor um, i think that you know the middle class and the elite have long opted out of all public systems because they felt secure and protected in in the money that they had that could buy the best education the best health care uh, you know generators in their homes security guards outside we don't need the state because uh, we will buy the best for ourselves and, and whatever the moral flaws of that argument uh, the flaws of it in in in, in practical terms actually were, were demonstrated in during the second wave when the middle class was you know as amitabh was saying i i i have never met not yet met a single person from the middle classes who has not had somebody close to him or her uh, in family or in work or among friends who did not uh, struggle to get a hospital bed struggle to get oxygen uh, and died uh, because the whole system broke down the for profit public uh, private care system did not deliver when we really needed a health system 80% of trained doctors in india work for the for profit sector uh, and they they more or less abandoned the people when they were most needed uh, and we need a very strong within it a strong primary health care system um, can we afford this i know i'm running out of time i'll just make two more points uh, people say we can't afford this where's the money for it uh, of course we can afford it and we must afford it uh, india's tax to D gdp ratios are uh, among the lowest in the world and much of it is indirect taxes we cannot afford it because we have refused uh, to tax the rich and even less tax the super rich that is where the pathway that we have to go uh, uh, prabhat patnaik uh, has calculated that uh, a, a framework of universal social rights of the kind that we spoke about would cost us maybe an additional 10% of gdp uh, that we would raise taxes even if to 24% although some of it would come back through the multiplier effect but even if we say a tax to gdp ratio of 24% it's about what the united states uh, has and uh, and you know um, uh, a wealth tax uh, 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 the oxfam report itself said that a, a tax of just 1 and a half percent on on the wealth of of dollar billionaires around the world is more than enough to ensure that you know there's uh, decent education for all healthcare for all and so on and so forth i think you know when we look at and assess neoliberalism now it's useful to remember gandhi ji's talisman uh, think of the most disadvantaged person you know and, uh, and think of whether what we are doing uh, would benefit her if we had held the talisman in, our, in his hand our prime minister could never have called for the nation by lockdown uh, of the kind uh, with the you know totality and cruelty uh, but if you had really thought about what it would do to india's poorest uh, and finally uh, the idea of social protection uh, and universal social rights what does it really mean in the end uh, noam chomsky one of the world's leading intellectuals said social protection is ultimately the idea that we should take care of each other and i think you know there can be uh, no more uh, beautiful and succinct uh, man, uh, you know, articulation of what we are talking about we have to build a society and a state in which we take care of each other and uh, the time for that has long been overdue 
uh, if we don't learn from um, the catastrophe of human suffering that our response uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the to COVID has 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 uh, has has laid bare before us, uh, then uh, I think future generations are not going to forgive us for uh, for being so absolutely bereft of public compassion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Harshi. Uh, that's that's very powerful, you know. And, and just what you were saying uh, in terms of uh, particularly the resources not being available, you know, the the completely false argument that's built. Uh, the 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 Panama Papers now the Pandora Papers are again telling us that there are resources, and and as you said, if Prabhat Patnaik is saying it's twenty four percent, if I remember correctly, then Canada, Sweden, Norway, they're all in their 40s, mm -hmm. uh, not just 24 persons, way ahead of us. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think Brazil, Mexico would be also in that range of 24 percent, which are our, our peers from uh, BRICS. So thank you. And I, I you know, I think the, the minimum floor of dignity uh, and universal social protection is really the, the big message uh, coming from you. And ultimately, how do we root it also in the the, the framework of, of, of compassion as as a central pillar? Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, can I request Mr. Raju now? Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Amitabh. Am I audible? Yes, very well. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I just would like to highlight the single most challenge the country is now facing. That is to save our constitution. I think the kind of vision that you have articulated or uh, Arsh has articulated will not become possible unless we are able to save the constitution that we have given to us to our people. Because today the constitution is threatened and the constitution values are totally a, a demolished attacked. Why? Because the current dispensation at the center has not been an active player or a participant or a partner in making the constitution if you go into the history. The current dispensation at the center has not been the part of the freedom struggle which has shaped the values that has carried the constitution. So the, the fundamental problem actually starts from that. There is no ownership of the constitution values by the current dispensation. But at the same time, the current dispensation of the center cannot do away with the constitution. So what they have found it easy to do is to demolish the constitutional institutions so that the constitution for a period of time will become clear. That is what has been happening during the last seven years. Every conceivable constitutional institutions have been hijacked. They have been rendered uh, 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 not uh, useful. They have been totally captured. And also, there is a clear uh, evidence that the media also is fully captured. And if you look at the deliberative forums that the constitution has given to us, whether state assemblies or, or the parliament, these deliberative assemblies uh, forums have stopped functioning. The way the uh, legislations are uh, discussed and passed, we are seeing that there is hardly any discussion. The way the budget is discussed, people do not know where the budget is going, what is the uh, expected outcome of uh, uh, budget items, nothing of that is happening in our parliament. So, and the, the constitutional institutions, uh, they are also totally uh, uh, become uh, uh, silent. So, I think uh, the civil society collectively addresses this fundamental challenge as how to save the constitution we will not be able to uh, uh, really expand the, uh, the rights. We will not be able to actualize the rights given to the citizens. So that is where I feel that apart from the civil society, 
a activism civil society uh, uh, exposing these uh, fault lines there is a dire need for educating the people as to what kind of government we are conducting what kind of institutions that are uh, uh, growing and functioning then only uh, there will be uh, some element of uh, uh, change of direction towards protecting our constitution today the fundamental right to expression is also uh, uh, curtailed uh, uh, we have seen how the agitating farmers against the black farm laws the kind of violence that was unleashed to them and when the political parties try to visit the families uh, 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 the victims the way they were uh, prevented all these things uh, show that there is a deliberate attempt to kind of silence the uh, voice the uh, deliberate attempt to uh, prevent you from expressing your views this is something that is the biggest danger that we need to really address the second uh, uh, issue i would like to flag is the the the, the plight of the marginalized section scheduled caste scheduled tribes for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes it is the constitution that really gives them the rights when the constitution is at stake their fundamental rights their their their, their dignity is also uh, is seriously jeopardized the the the, the 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 present government has least concern about the disparities between the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes when compared to the rest of the society there is to be a very very a sound policy of Uh, central government assessing what are the gaps between the scheduled caste scheduled tribes and compared to rest of the society on various developmental parameters and come up with the plans to accelerate the development of scheduled caste and scheduled tribes so that the gaps between them when compared to rest of the society are bridged on various developmental par- parameters that is education access to health housing um livelihoods employment and all these parameters the state was supposed to be conscious of what are the gaps between these marginalized sections and compared to the civil society and put in budget resources to accelerate their development so that the gaps between them is bridged that fundamental policy to bring in equity in the society by by putting trust on the development of scs and sts that whole policy has been dumped by the present dispensation there is no discourse in the country nowhere in the in the country there is a discussion on these gaps in the development there is no estimation of gaps in development there is no public outcry uh, uh, on the gaps uh, in the developments and demand for bridging these gaps so that is one area that we need to really look at it. and at a, at a at a society level also i think the the fundamental to the the question of tribal caste is the caste system that there is no discourse there is no debate on what are the what are the measures that need to be taken to annihilate the caste we don't hear uh the the discussion on annihilation of caste the society seem to have taken caste for granted the society seem to have uh, uh, come to a conclusion that caste is something that cannot be annihilated but unless caste is annihilated the hierarchies will not go and the equity in the society cannot be uh, cannot be achieved so that fundamental question needs to be addressed finally i find i find apart from looking at the right space paradigm uh, and that you are right when you, uh, when you observe that while pursuing our our endeavor for expanding the 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 boundaries of right space paradigm there was a total neglect of what is happening at a micro level i think it is time has come for us to uh, give equal focus at the uh, uh, when i mean, I, mean uh, i meant to say that we ignored 
what is happening at the macro level the macro economy the kind of macro economy how it is uh, working on the ground how it is uh, resulting in this kind of uh, inequities how it is uh, depriving certain sections of society there was no discussion or debate in the political parties on the macro economic policies and its uh, imminent impact on uh, depriving certain sections of the society and consequently we are now seeing that every macro economic policy that the country has come to adopt the society has taken for granted everybody has accepted without questioning it has very seriously uh, impacted the lives livelihoods of the poor people it has brought in uh, it has widened the inequities it has uh, 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 it has made lives of large sections of the poor very uh, invisible so that is uh, something uh, that the, the uh, intellectuals economists policy makers and the civil societies need to keep an eye on the macro economic uh, in, in what direction we are taking the economy those questions need to be raised otherwise our efforts to and though the citizens with uh, uh, rights will not have any meaning and finally i would like to conclude by 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 uh, by mentioning that in the pandemic the the plight of the 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 urban poor that we have seen it clearly shows that there such a large section of the uh, workforce were literally invisible to the planners and uh, uh, the policy makers they were just invisible so i think i think uh, 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 what is the need of the hour is to really recognize that we have forgotten them and we need to understand their lives in the uh, urban areas we need to understand their their uh, their, their uh, um, vulnerabilities and the policies need to be framed on those lines finally the the social security for the unemployed workers there was a legislation the year 2008 to, to provide for uh, universal social security for the unemployed workers even after 12 years of that legislation nothing really happened substantively to provide the social security for the unemployed workers and the present uh, the the uh, social security code passed by the parliament uh, in uh, 2019 has made the social security more complicated uh, impossible to implement more more uh, uh, implementing agencies were brought into picture and hardly any financing was talked about in the court so literally the court is saying that there won't be any financial support for providing social security and the mechanisms for providing social security are also Uh, 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 are not clearly envisioned. So, in the process, what is likely to happen is whatever social security that states have already put in place, they are also being uh, jeopardized with this new paradigm. So, in the name of expanding the rights of uh, laborers through these courts, whatever rights the laborers used to earlier uh, uh, access, they are being taken away. That is something that we need to really look at and. what was a matter of concern is when these codes were passed uh, the social security code in 2019 and the remaining three codes in 2020 there was hardly any approval in the society there was any hardly any any discussion in the media also so that only shows that these people on whose sweat and blood the economy is built are becoming invisible so we need to recognize that and we need to really Uh, uh, uh bring them to the light and we 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 need to uh, understand what is the macro economic paradigm that will address their you know, concerns and their aspirations thank you many thanks mr raju uh, again some very very critical uh, points for us uh, as in we're looking at Uh, rights but the larger question of defending the constitution and defending the constitutional uh, institutions 
and I would even say uh, the constitutional morality that we talk of, just the preamble itself, is is probably the most central struggle at the moment. And, and all the others would feed into that struggle, but that's probably the, the most uh, critical question. And the second that uh, you're also talking of the marginalized sections, and, and particularly how in the public domain also discussions about even developmental deficits are not happening. You know, annihilation of caste is certainly, it's been kind of wiped out, but even the deficits of development have, have really not been uh, discussed. That's not being addressed. Uh, and the final question that you're uh, asking, particularly around the social security, I think that's, that's also an interesting question for all of us, that uh, enactment of rights and the realization of rights, there's a fairly long journey uh how do we ensure the realization of rights for the last person that Hershey reminded us of the the gandhi is talisman because you have we have a plethora of rights uh how do we ensure that the entitlements actually are there with with the most marginalized I, you know that that's also a, a central question and thank you also for reinforcing the the macroeconomic uh, structures uh, and the trajectory uh, Nikhil, can I request you to go next? Suddenly, we have lost your view. I don't know yeah. why, but we can hear you well, but we were yeah, seeing you well also earlier. But at this moment, at least I can't see you. I'm not sure of others, but I can't. Nobody can see me. So oh, that's a pity. I can see myself, okay. so I never got to know when I dropped off. But anyway, um, please, please. So I'll ahead. just speak yeah. then, I think, if that's okay. We hear you well. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, there's not much in my face, so it's fine. Um, I think what what I'd like to start off by saying is I'll, I'll kind of personalize this in terms of my own journey uh, that I started work towards the mid and late 80s, and in cases, which is the organization which with which I have spent the bulk of my period of time of work, which is the Mazur Kisan Chakti Sangatun, uh, was formed in, on the 1st of May 1990. And our work that preceded that about three years before that in that area that we worked. Now that was a time, so I think from that period onwards, if I would evaluate it, it has been one hostile wave after another, mostly with a slight blip in between. And if we were to talk about neoliberal globalization, that was sort of when its great uh, idea of hope was sweeping right across. So what made us form an organization called Mazdoor Kisan Chakti Sangatan on the 1st of May, 1990? It's when communism was collapsing right across the world. It's when the free market was held out as this great panacea for everything that uh, the state could and would not be able to provide anything and it had been shown as being the god that failed and the god that would work was going to be the market and the free market and in the midst of that in one little part of central Rajasthan you have a small independent organization coming up and to me looking back on that it is because those sets of people found nothing of any value in that free market discourse. They were large numbers of people. They were completely left out of this whole free market thing. And it's not that they necessarily had had seen the seen the fruits of communism or socialism either. Because I think if I look back again at the period when I started this work, there was very little that the very poor. I mean, they were very unorganized. There were pockets of organized labor uh, where mill workers were and others were, and these were sets of people who were still benefiting from democracy, certainly coming out of a kind of extreme form of feudal control, but they were beginning to organize themselves and that just continued. And therefore, to me, they started, we started in our area with those traditional issues of peasants and workers in terms of land and minimum wages. And because of our times, out of those issues came the right to information. Out of those issues came a kind of a discourse that has lasted the next 30 years for us. That you said 
that actually because this neoliberal framework claimed to have great transparency, claimed that the market would bring in a whole lot of uh, areas that, that democracy itself could survive along with capitalism. And those were the things that people had to latch on to. And therefore, they started saying, okay, let us use transparency to show what is actually there in what is supposed to be provided to people. So the slogan even of Hamara Pesa, Hamara Isa, Ba Mani, our accounts, was to lay claim to that money in a democratic framework, because that's what they could latch on to. And therefore, uh, the legitimacy came because, because everything else talking about socialism had been delegitimized and people still had, still had their eye very clearly on issues of equality and social, social, economic and political equality. And I think that is something that will last through the ages. It's not something that I think we package it differently. We talk about our ideology in different forms. But looking back on it, people have always wanted social equality. They've always wanted economic equality. And they've always wanted political equality. But they, it's what they can hang on to at a particular time and how creative and how powerful they can be. Because they are the ones who came up with saying, OK, this is what we have to fight for and be able to make it available to be able to expose how much one section and segment of society is actually doing away with with whatever little that people have and to hang on to it and therefore if you see between the period of 1990 and uh, when neoliberal globalization was supposed to make india shine when you come to a period of 2000 around 2004 2005 that election which everyone in middle class india thought would actually go with india shining in fact, even the rest of the people surprised themselves by finding out that actually did not find so much in it. And you had that period when the rights-based laws started to come in. So from 2005, the period when Harsh and Raju and, and that, that particular bit of space within government that, that uh, was there to respond to this voice from people saying that we are actually facing extreme forms of misery and extreme forms of unhappiness and to the extent possible they were organizing they were articulating so they were articulating both these laws if we look at them the right to information and right and and the employment guarantee act i'd like to look at it in a term in terms of kind of an intersection intersectionality that the employment guarantee act and even if mr raju recalls first went actually within the government of India to the labor ministry. And because the labor ministry had got completely delegitimized, labor rights were getting delegitimized. The neoliberal framework said nothing. There was no chance for anything. They started hanging on to citizenship rights. So actually, NREG is a very interesting combination of labor rights and citizenship rights. It says everyone should get a right to work. It says everyone should get the right to minimum wages. It says, but it brings in the labor cause by saying there should be a right to organize. Where you have people organizing, and we know in our own area, where there are unionizing of Narega workers and even women who have never been in the workforce, it's extraordinary how much they manage to achieve and how much they manage to fight, even amongst all the other groups. So this kind of combination of economic and political and social rights within NREGA, because NREGA does actually reach out to Dalits, to women, women more than any any other time on the labor side. And if you look at RTI, again, the articulation from people, it was not an esoteric right that was fought for by the upper class or by the literate class, or it was not out of Article 19 1A of the Constitution in terms of freedom of expression. It was the right to life, Article 21. It was hum janenge, hum jienge. It was out of equality say who has all the grain and who doesn't who has the resources and who doesn't and therefore right to information became a part of what mr shankaran called a transformatory right it attached itself onto every other battle whether it was an economic battle or a social battle or a political battle it became an intersectional issue and that's what has made it so powerful and what's made it last now we have had a pushback against that period where we had 10 laws. I don't think just the RTI and NREGA. 
the forest strikes act is an extraordinary one you cannot make it go down you can't you you have had amendments against the right to information you talked about the hollowing of rights yes but you have still had a parallel very powerful movement on nrega which lasted right through on the right to food which lasted right through covid and its attack and these are the ones that have saved people to whatever extent even the last people that arch has talked about and they have saved it because people are actually invested in those particular rights and the right to information also even today there are 7 to 8 million users at that and every right there are still people being killed it's still being fought every individual battle on a right rti battle is extraordinary even though the government wants to undermine the law so it's beyond the law it's transcended the law and therefore i think just by giving these two examples the kind of intersectionality that people have put put into the rights based approach is something we need to understand and they are invested in it and they are fighting it now of course there is a big very powerful right wing uh almost fascist in in many places kind of group coming in hollowing out democracy itself and you cannot fight for your rights without a democratic framework and therefore what mr raju said i think on the side of political rights we have had the complete hollowing out of our dem democratic framework all our independent institutions are hollowed out uh, everything except just the technicality of the right to vote is being hollowed out but what was hollowed out much earlier right all through i think was the directive principles of state policy from the time that we passed it it is something we have done never done anything more than pay lip service to so actually right to education right to food right to employment right to health could have only occurred if we had gone with the dpsp the directive principles of state policy and they were never actually the directive principles of state policy and crony capitalism had a long long history in the congress party and everyone else and they are the ones who have taken over on that side where where people are trying to fight so i think what i'd like to say that today the constitution even though it's even though the ruling party is paying lip service to it it's become a de facto contested space in many ways the the areas of uh, of uh, if you can if you uh, want to call it a welfare state that has already been severely undermined because the dpsp was already undermined and because the only ones we are surviving with are those rights based laws where people were invested otherwise they are completely whittling down and even that is under attack but it's still surviving and the contested space is where we did have some amount of freedom of expression that has completely that is under very severe attack but as you said it is people who are fighting back and people will continue to fight back and i don't think that they are i mean i think they have had they are so much uh, uh, under attack they have been so much under attack the kinds of people that i have certainly lived with have always been at the edge of survival and it is now that you have this pernicious mix of religion and politics that has been deliberately brought in that makes it something that i think a lot of us just do not know how to deal with we have grown up in our country with a framework where at least this was considered all to be something that you would not you would not play with completely destroying society post independence i think pre independence it was there for a while but post independence it was considered that you would not complete you would not have legitimacy to do that the way that the ruling party and its its clique has and that is something that threatens the framework the constitutional framework that mr raju says it threatens our being able to give any kind of help that that harsh says for the last person with dignity because the last person with dignity under attack is today is that minority is not just the person who is economically bad off badly off it's that minority who has lost any kind of legitimacy to be able to fight and and to say that what you are doing is not on so i think the last thing i'd like to end with is amita we are on what you talked about equality and inequality it is just completely horrible the fact that today i mean you were talked about the 11 people and you talk your own report brought out the oxfam inequality report about the 13 lakh crores that was earned by 
uh, the billionaires of India, the top hundred or whatever, which could run in RG for ten years. But last year, Gautam Adani is supposed to have what is income from one lakh twenty thousand crores to five lakh eighty thousand crores figures that have just come out day before yesterday. How can people possibly survive? How can the earth survive? How can a country like India survive? And in just to make some kind of equal, uh, some kind of polarized unity, you are throwing matchboxes. You are you are lighting fires of polarization right across the country. So I think to us, it is something that we don't have a clear answer to. We still have our people. Who are still organizing in parallel, and it's not like today. I would say in the areas where we are, we are stronger than we have been before, but the forces against us are much, much stronger, and much, much more pernicious, and much, much more vicious in what they want to do. And I think to that we have no real answer. Thank you, thank you, Nikhil, and and, and thank you for uh, also bringing in uh, hope. uh in terms of not certainly at the end but uh, you know you you what you've been saying i think it's very important where people are invested where people have owned the rights those rights have become in some ways inalienable and they're fighting for it they're defending it and it is even for a hostile regime an extremely hostile regime it's not going to be easy to take away those rights you know i i think that's that's very very powerful and and for us to kind of constantly go back to because that that certainly is inspiring uh, and the second idea that you know i've noted is the the whole idea of intersectionality of of rights which is so critical uh, and and you actually talked of the lived experience of of uh, how it worked the third i think which is very important is we have not adequately looked at the transformational rights that you talk of how rti was able to play that role what are those other rights i think it's it's also important to start thinking about that and and uh, was a creation of gram sabhas direct democracy spaces was that the possibility of that transformational space but we need to uh, certainly look at that and and uh, then i think the point that you're making is uh, for me very very important is that the complete collapse of at least the uh, the normative consensus that we had post independence whether people lived by it or not but at least there was a consensus uh, apparent consensus around it and that's collapsed uh, and, and then you're looking at a <coughs> contested space at multiple levels and and mr raju also talked about it so thank you uh, uh, nikhil thank you harsh ji thank you uh, mr raju uh, i'm not sure how we take questions we have around 15 20 minutes so can we just quickly uh if somebody could help me because i see almost 280 people as participating in this conversation but when i see the question answer then i have only 5 6 people i see sam uh, you have a question so would you want to articulate it i don't know if you can actually unmute yourself or Yes, Sam. I can see you. Yes. So if you just yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you for the, the talk. I, I learned an enormous amount. I'm in the United States, so uh, hearing the experiences, uh, your experiences, and the on the ground realities. Um, unfortunately, many resonate to the same things that we're experiencing here in the United States in terms of the extreme inequality, the lack of concern uh, for for people. uh and the uh, polarization and nationalism and uh, bringing politics and religion and all of these things uh together in a, a way that is threatening um so i felt a lot of solidarity <laughs> desire listening to you um one of the things that uh is hopeful to me and i've been hearing it in some of the conversations here uh is the amount of attention that people are paying now to the the monetary systems in particular the the way in which money is created uh and the way that the the coronavirus um relief efforts and the quantitative easing and all of these things revealed 
that there is an ability to create uh, additional monetary counting units, you know, for things that are needed and are important. Um, and more and more people here uh, and in Europe, I'm seeing during this conference, are are uh, focusing on uh, seizing that power, <laughs> um, whether it's talking about monetary, modern monetary theory or a jobs guarantee that be funded uh, with debt-free money from the treasury. Um, and I'm just curious to know, has is that conversation also happening in India? Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sam. So do we have other questions? Because I went to the question and answer column. Uh, and this is the only question I see from Sam. This is a certainly for me a fairly challenging technological platform. Uh, but so if anybody could tell me if there's some questions anywhere else. So all of you are smiling. I, I'm not sure if you can see any other questions. Okay, so so let's let's just you know take this question and if there are any other comments that you would like to make after listening to each other, uh, and and uh, yeah we we can then conclude. So maybe see this as some concluding thoughts uh, from from you. So let's let's go back in the same order, Harshji. Amitabh, do you have any questions? Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think you've kind of uh, responded to the questions I had because, uh, you know, in a way, I also feel what's already been said that at this moment, uh, it is really the battle for, for democracy. And we'll not, without uh, that battle, I think a lot of these rights will get hollowed out. And even in this context, as as Nikhil is saying, where does the real uh, uh, energy come from? It is going to be from the people who are uh, fighting their real battles uh, for for survival and dignity. So you know that that's that's something fairly uh, important for us. And you, Harshi, have already talked of you know even some formulations of how do we move ahead. So whether it's the di idea of minimum floor of dignity universal uh, social rights. So there is a framework that we have. Uh, I would be certainly keen to hear from all three of you uh, that how do we actually strengthen the battle for the democratic uh, uh, morality that we are talking of. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, uh, there's, so, there's so much to, uh, to continue in this discussion. Uh, I like uh, Many things that were said, but I, uh, you know, I wanted to hold on to Raju's uh, observation that ultimately this is a battle about the constitution itself, and about Nikhil uh, uh, saying that we're trying to defend the rights of the poorest at a time when uh, identities are being attacked in a way that we have not seen uh, since independence, and I think that I, I'm I'm very happy that these two points were made. Um, I, I think that uh, at one level, many people ask me, uh, you know, can you sort of briefly tell us how do we fight, uh, you know, the, the, the total destruction of democracy and, uh, and the constitution that we see uh, happening in, around us in India today. And uh, uh, people often think about this as something that can be fought in a strategic kind of with electoral com coming, we get the alliances right between political parties. We are clever about what we say and what we don't say. But I don't think, I mean, I don't agree at all. Uh, I think that this is a, a very critical civilizational moment. And uh, it's not, I mean, you know, when I say this, uh, many people's eyes glaze over that, oh, this is sort of impractical idealism and we want sort of practical stuff here but i think i wanted to remind uh, people that it was actually ordinary people themselves during the anti-ca protest which was the largest uh, you know, public peaceful uprising that we've seen since independence where they spontaneously made the constitution uh, the icon of of the struggle 
and I think that, that they have understood something more than many of us who are uh, sort of intellectuals and so on uh, have understood that there's something so fundamental that was promised in the constitution. Uh, and, and what was it? It was justice for all, it was the freedom to practice one's faith, freedom to dissent, and the idea of the equal worth and dignity of every human being. And I think, you know, most importantly, I was speaking in a public lecture a few days ago on Gandhiji's birthday, saying that to me, uh, and not just to me, the core I, and the most forgotten idea, and probably the most difficult idea of the constitution is the idea of fraternity. The idea that we are bound to and with each other. Uh, Dr. Ambedkar had said that why it is fundamental, it, it is the most fundamental idea of the constitution is that justice, liberty, equality can be achieved without fraternity, but then need the force of the state. But if we have fraternity, then it's a, then it's a, a society in which justice for all, uh, freedom for all, and equality becomes a natural order of things. And I think that uh, what I did want to say is that this battle has to be fought against uh, the state. It has to be fought against crony capitalism, against, uh, uh, against the policies that we're seeing around us. But in the end, it's a battle that we have to fight with ourselves. Uh, it is in society that we will accomplish a framework of, of lived fraternity. It is only in that that we can then reconceptualize an economic model. Uh, you know, or, you know, Sam was talking a little about how much resonance what we were talking about has with the United States. And I think across the world we are seeing uh, uh, a system which validizes and leaders coming up with validize inequality uh, and, and markets. But even more so, it's become around the world the most dangerous time in, in, in recent history to be a minority anywhere in the world. And I think it's addressing these questions as society uh, that I wanted to just suggest that it's, it's the problem is, you know, one problem is out there, the three problems are pointing towards us. Uh, and, and I think we must remember how, and it is these battles that we have to fight in our in our own families, in our, among our friends, uh, in our workplaces, in the discourse that we have on social media. It is here that these battles need to be fought and there is no other shortcut to this. Thank you. Thank you, Harji. Rajuji? Yeah. I think uh, any discussion on democracy should really look at our electoral systems in place. I think there is a huge fault line that needs to be addressed. Today, the way the elections happen, the way the candidates spend money to contest, like for example, ordinary people who have that sense of service to the society, he cannot imagine to contest an election and win unless he has the money. So, a whole lot of electoral reforms have to happen. Otherwise, I have a feeling that the right to vote, the universal franchise that constitution has given the people has been, has been actually purchased by the uh, capitalists, by the, by the rich people. Uh, they buy the votes, they, 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 they influence the electoral outcome. So, the role of money is something that we need to really address. Unless that is cleansed, we will not be able to uh, uh, really save our democracy. That is an agenda that we need to really look at. Not much is being talked about it. Uh, that is very fundamental. The second equally important is the, the processes that democratic institutions are following in bringing out the policies or legislations. Here I recollect the way the National Advisory Council is to look at uh, public policy, the kind of consultations the NAC is to do with all the stakeholders, with the state governments, with the NGOs, with the uh, 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 technocrats, experts, and uh, recommend to the government uh, uh, very wide consultations is to happen. But today I find 
no such wider consultations do happen uh, at any level uh, you know, when a policy is formulated or when a legislation is uh, formulated introduced in the cabinet and passed in the parliament. So a lot of pre-legislative consultations need to be mandated uh, like in, uh, in some other Western countries. So that is another reform that would engage the people in conversation. They will actually participate in the in the policy making. Otherwise, they don't feel that they are part of the governance process. So that is another important area that we need to look at to really protect the values of the democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Rajuji. Nikhil? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, firstly, on the question that Sam has asked, I think both Sam's question and some of the things that we are addressing at on, on a macro level to me actually the inequalities that exist are just so enormous and they are growing so much more that that same bit that we used for speak about Ambedkar and where Harsh speaks about Ambedkar talking about fraternity being important and being a natural order of things and otherwise a constable having to enforce it just before that is where Ambedkar talks about our social and economic inequalities being able to blow up this entire structure, which which is where you can have this combination of liberty, equality, fraternity um, in a social democracy. I think to my mind, the inequalities have just grown more and more. And it is at a point really uh, that political democracy is under threat because we manage that political democracy and it is extremely important. And Mr. Raju, to me, it's not electoral reforms anymore. If you have someone with so much money that they have, they will play any electoral system because they really have the capacity to buy over every single voter, every single party, one opposition, whether it's one or three oppositions, all of them together. And it is really, where, where they have purchased our entire electoral system. So it's not a question of putting one law in place or the other. They are capable of working their way around anything and everything. And therefore, we are at a point where we have to be able to address these enormous inequalities that exist. And I think, to my mind, that's why even this question of that Sam asked, that macroeconomics and monetary system re systemic reform I think the battle that we'll see is between these massive big capitalist uh, forces. It's just between them. The rest of us have nothing to do in that. They are the ones who are completely, it is crony capitalism, where the battle is only between one group and the other. And government is, uh, is finding itself trying to ease one force or the other. And this is what, what one kind of sees. In parallel, I think we have to see in a sense that what will people do we go back to that that no matter what people are still they have gone through a certain number of years of a certain kind of democratic culture being built i think caste has been fought very very powerfully over the last uh, 70 years in in many many ways and against impossible odds and i think huge changes have been given in that I think even on the question where, where we had something as terrible as the Citizenship Amendment Act, it was fought by Muslim women, by Muslims all over, and set people who did not see this as something that was legitimate and should happen. I think that's somewhere it, out of that, out of people just not willing to accept this lot that is exploiting the death. You know, it is 99% versus 1%. It is when those 99% manage to forge some kind of um, idea of solidarity and fraternity that we will see something and that's not immediately on the horizon. But how quickly it can come, I don't think we can imagine that. It can come because there is literally a 1% versus a 99%. It's just not happening. And maybe none of us can engineer it. Maybe all of us can only be keep trying to, to keep those forces uh, going that have been positive towards these ideas of equality and social democracy. 
Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. And uh, uh, it's been really uh, a stimulating conversation. Uh, Sam, you know, my very brief response to what you said uh, or the question that you asked would be uh, that I, I do think that there's a very, very robust uh, opposition and uh, defense for the constitutional morality for the constitution that we have certainly at the level of ideas and people are struggling but unfortunately at the macroeconomic uh, level or macroeconomic questions we still do not have very robust responses uh, it almost seems like there is a consensus and there are very few people who are willing to challenge that and that itself is a problem i do think that moving ahead our democratic struggle is going to be incomplete if we do not look at alternative macroeconomic conceptions. So it's not going to work because I do feel that this assault on democracy is also part of the market fundamentalism and the moment of neoliberalism we are in, the inequality that we are all talking of. So at this moment, if we don't look at real macro alternatives of how we organize our economics, it's unlikely uh, that our democratic battles would, would succeed. So, so that's my response. And, and in, in some ways, it's not happening adequately uh, in, in India at the moment. Uh, but but we do need to think about it. So thanks, Sam, for for that. And and thank you, Harshji, Rajuji, Nikhil, for your know, very very stimulating conversation. Certainly helps us think together about what could be some of the next steps. Gives gives me hope. Uh, um, and uh, let me again thank the Global Forum, uh, Professor Neera Chandok, uh, Pushpraj, and Samrut Bharat Foundation. Uh, thank you. And, and friends who've joined in uh, into this conversation. Grateful. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.